Hello everyone. I hope you're all in great spirits and fine form and still full of all that new year positive energy. Today we've got a lovely, lovely day and we're traveling to meet with some friends of ours, Con and Neve. So we're traveling through a mountain pass which is between the Mam Turks and the Twelve Bends. We're going from County Galway into County Mayo. We have a little passenger with us but he's not coming the full way. So here he is. We're going to release him now onto the mountain. He's a rat. They tend to get into houses through the roofs so he's obviously found some little place on our roof that he could get in through and we've caught he's a big fella we've caught him in this humane trap and um, much better than using poison because we can let him go miles from home go free ratty go with love don't come back <laughs> yeah the humane traps are great because there's no knock-on effect of harming other creatures and um you know, we can use the trap again. So we're heading off to visit Con and Neve at the Celtic Druid Temple. So this is my friend Con of the Celtic Druid Temple and we're here in the Hemp Hall and um, Con, you're a senior druid with the Celtic Druid Temple. So what do you do? What's your role? Uh, well, my role as a druid covers many different things. Mm. Uh, we do ceremonies, public and private. Uh, we do healings. We do guidance, life path guidance. Okay. Um, we are very involved with planting trees and looking after uh, broadleaf forests. Yeah. And uh, trying to show people that there is another way to, to live in connection with the earth. Oh, beautiful. And what kind of ceremonies do you do? Well, we do public ceremonies and private ceremonies. Right. The public ceremonies would be the uh, full moon ceremonies we do in Tara and in Vienna, in Austria, here at the Celtic Druid Temple. Right. And that's for the full moon. Uh, occasionally we do other ceremonies that are open, we call them public. Yes. And then the private ceremonies would be weddings and oh. fastings. We do legal weddings here as well, of course. Baby welcoming and naming ceremonies, coming of age ceremonies, yeah. and of course, last rites. Yeah. Uh, do many people take up the offer of a ceremony as a last rite? Uh, not too many, because we, we're not, uh, let me say, we're not business-like about this. We don't go around advertising and trying to sell it. Okay. But let's say the last of the last rites, the ceremonies that I did, was from my own uncle. Right. So, and it's a beautiful thing to be able to help somebody take the step over into that other realm. And to ease everybody's mm. uh, inner feelings because yes. uh, the modern way is to feel sad, yeah. whereas the old Celtic way would be to be happy. And to rejoice. That you now have a friend on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's easily uh, facilitated mm. when you understand that the people really want to remember the deceased uh, in the happy times. Yeah, the, of course. The magic days when yeah. they made them smile and made them feel yeah. good. And how did you get into this then? Uh, I had been for a long time uh, living in Dublin mm. and researching the ancient monuments in the Dublin and Wicklow Mountains. Right. And uh, I managed to find a lot of unlisted monuments and got quite a few of them listed. But by sitting on the, the ancient sites, the, the holy temples, and literally doing nothing mm. and allowing the clouds to roll by and to connect and to feel deep inside, you begin to see the world in a new way. So I think that was a soul food of a high value. People think meditation is you have to sit in a specific position and chant just one word. Mm. But meditation can be just living happiness yeah. without having to think too hard. Yeah. People are kind of addicted to thinking. Uh, yeah, making <laughs> things difficult for themselves. So when they begin to allow the feelings and the intuition through, mm. they can actually just uh, drift. Right. And if you do the drifting at a sacred site, yeah. you're feeding. You really are feeding. And uh, 
it just develops who you are, helps you to wake up to your true nature. Mm-hmm. And you're making that connection to nature as well while you're out there. Absolutely. And you're talking about the clouds, which is the sky realm, you're on the land. So what about sea? Because there's that triad of earth, sea and sky. Yeah, well, the best way for us to understand the sea uh, is on the beach, obviously, mm. with the tide coming in mm-hmm. to realise that the, the three realms are meeting. Yeah. And you can stand where the sea washes over the sand. You can stand with your hair up in the air, your feet solid on the, the sand underneath you, and the sea climbing up your legs. It's a beautiful liminal. That's all the three realms at once. Yeah, a lovely liminal space full of magic. And um, so, what about the trees then? Because everybody imagines that a druid is an oak tree worshipper or an oak tree um, priest of some kind. How would you define it? Well, I wouldn't focus at all primarily on any one tree. Mm-hmm. That would be to devalue all the other trees. I think the a range of different trees in an area is what makes a forest. Right. And then the predominant trees would be the biggest and oldest trees. Uh, it's not very well known, but the ash tree in Ireland can grow to be as big as an oak tree. Oh yeah, I've seen I've seen some that big. But I don't think the Druids would have focused on any one tree. Right. I think that's a bit of romanticism that's come in during the Enlightenment era in the late 1800s. I don't think it's uh, true that the Druids worshipped anything, Mm -hmm. except maybe truth. Yes, because (coughs) truth... What I've done in my research, I discovered that truth is one of the main components in healing that if there isn't truth you can't have healing so I think you're right about Mm. about that and also I think in Roman writings there was talk about um, you know the Celts being barbaric and worshipping nature but you would say they weren't worshipping it at all they were communing, copying well we are part of nature yeah when the, the Romans wrote their stuff they were writing from outside of nature. So their views, if you like, are not relevant. The whole whole idea of uh, worshipping can only really be done for another human who can give you things. Okay. And, you know, dear God, give me this, dear God, give me that. That's not part of the drug path. Right. Whereas the gods, as such, may be used for inspiration or their unique characteristics or special abilities might be used to encourage yourself yes. to develop these abilities. You don't ask them to give them to you. Yes. <coughs> so you invoke them and evoke them then in yourself. When we read old myths and legends, when we hear about shape-shifting, I suppose if you're on the path, on a druid path or on a nature spiritual path, you are going to be making that deep connection with things, which is a form of shape-shifting because you then feel what it's like to be another being. Mm. Can you say anything about that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think there's a lot in that, but I think we have to undo a little bit of Hollywood. Okay. Right? In Hollywood, everything is dun 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 and instant glory and instant superpowers and all the rest of it. The shape shifting that myself and Neve have done here mm. was a derelict piece of land of six hectares, 16 acres, that was so derelict that... Uh, you couldn't grow anything. Yeah. We've shapeshifted that okay. into a broadleaf forest. That's beautiful. See, now that's real. Mm-hmm. But if Hollywood was to try and produce that in the movie, uh, it's not exciting, it's not fantastic, it's not now, it's not super hard. So it wouldn't fit. Yeah. So it's patience and time and... Yeah. The potential for a forest is in the seeds of the trees. Mm-hmm. And they do the shapeshifting on their own we can help it cooperate yeah. and support it. Yeah. But uh, do it right now? No. No. Okay. And um, when you're not teaching people and um, conducting ceremonies, you, you've become a bit of an expert leather worker. I took leather working up as a hobby because uh, when my son was about 12 years of age, we joined a reenactment group. Mm. And most of the people in the group wanted to dress as 
Normans or as Vikings. Okay. And we wanted to dress as Gael. And then everybody told me that the Gaels always went barefoot. Right. And I thought that was a stupid thing to, for anybody to say. Mm. So I did some research and I found out that not only did the Irish wear shoes, they were very unique, okay. highly, uh, highly technical and difficult to make shoes. Right. And that the high status shoes of our uh, ancient ancestors, the Celtic and pre-Celtic ancestors, uh, were very complicated. And then from that, I started making them. This is the most exquisitely beautiful shoe. And is this the same type of shoe that our ancestors would have worn? It's very similar. This shoe is based upon the Lochgara Celtic slipper. Lochgara is about 40 miles from here. Uh, it was a little lake filled with cran oaks. <clears throat> and when the cran oak was drained a bit, they found leather scraps. Right. Outside of these, cran oaks are uh, man-made little hills within the lake. <clears throat> and outside the cran oak, they found these uh, scraps of leather. <clears throat> when we look at the scraps of leather, we realise that they're shoes. And this particular shoe, or slipper, has a very unique logo of a sort here. Mm, it's like a knot. And it's very... I've stylized it a bit for this particular shoe, but very unique opposing P's with a center line and a flicked up heel at the back and a central uh, end to the vamp with little uh, triangles on it. So these are highly sophisticated, unnecessarily decorated and complex shoes. The original version had hidden stitching inside, but here I've done the stitching as a whip, a double whip stitching on the outside. Uh, trying to make a stronger shoe. As you can see, I've put an outsole on it. Uh, modern, hard-wearing, studded sole and heel. Because our ancestors walked uh, without a heel to their shoe. And they walked in a different way to us. They leaned forward as they walked. Mm. Whereas we tend to walk on our heels. But to make this a living shoe for this era, I've modernised it. So the, the upper part is still a single piece of leather. I've added a midsole and an outsole. So that shoe can trace, be traced back to maybe 3,000 years ago. Yeah. So to hold something from... It's a replica, but it's new. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, for me, it's a way of bringing it alive again. It's close as possible. And you make these boots too? Yeah, myself and Eve spent a whole day in the museum crypt underneath... Uh, Doyle Learn and special invitation and uh, we had access to all the leather footwear that was uh, in the museum and the uh, lady in charge of the crypt brought out a scrap of leather that was wrongly named wrongly uh, recorded in the museum lists but she said you might have interest in this because it's also a single piece yeah and this one dates from the Brian Brew era so this would have been Dublin's uh, Brian Boru era boot. Wow. So in case people don't know who Brian Boru was, he was, um, he was an Irish chieftain who was fighting the Vikings in the Dublin area. In 1014, there was a great battle of Clontarf mm. and uh, Brian Boru gathered his forces and some mercenary Vikings to fight on his behalf, took on the Vikings in Dublin. And uh, it was during this era that the remains of the boot that was found was left behind in Dublin City. Discovered during excavations in the 70s, badly recorded, listed in the wrong oh. place, and we got our hands on it. But you've revived it now and here it yeah. is. So I think of this as the, the thousand year boot, uh, Dublin's boot, it's but it's an Irish boot from the Viking era. I've added in some special touches here. One is the lacing. Yeah. And if you look carefully, you can see I've triple spoils put onto the top lace hook, uh, just because I could. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And is this a little bit of Owen? Or That's that my just... uh, maker's mark. Ah. It says, Con made me. Ah, in Owen. <laughs> we'll talk about Owen um, in another film, because that's uh, something that's really interesting as well. And you've got these lovely belts. And what, what, 
What's happening with the OM on the belts? Well, I decided to uh, revise the OM language for this modern era and to make it translatable to English. And in this particular belt, uh, there's an affirmation. This belt is uh, made and sold. And this affirmation is for uh, one man who wanted to write a specific thing on it. And I've done that for him. That's beautiful. And look at these two. These are the beautiful gifts that you brought from, from me and Lol. A little pouch and a little foraging bag that fits onto your belt. See, isn't that beautiful? And then this is incredible. This is what Lol has received as a gift. And this is a little fire starter kit in your beautiful handmade leather little box bag and all kinds of bits and pieces in here to start a fire if you're out in the wilds and you need to have warmth and food. So it's absolutely gorgeous. All of these things are on your website, aren't they? On the CelticShows.ie. Oh. where you'll find information on this. Mankind would have used tools like this for millennia. So to have something so beautifully made really makes you feel in touch with that heritage and the, and the past that we all share as human beings. And also our own Celtic heritage here because it's all made here in Ireland. Handmade. I, I think it's very important for people today to have some sort of craft or some skill outside of mainstream employment mm -hmm. that allows them to... Uh, develop and share and ultimately you know you can give stuff you're owning something which is going to last for well a lifetime and longer it's something you can pass on to people because it is so well made and so durable it's not a quick cheap thing that you just dispose of after one or two uses So it's been lovely talking to you today, Con. And because of the OM on the belt here, I'm very intrigued. So I'd like to come back and talk to you more about that. And maybe then you can tell us something about your book. That I'd, you've love written. To, I'd love to. And in the meantime, if you're interested in any of Con's work, um, it's CelticBoots.ie. Celtic Shoes. Celtic Shoes.ie. All the information will be in the box below with a link to Con's website and um, the Celtic Druid Temple. So, thanks, Terry. I hope you enjoyed today's film. If you did, subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And have a look at the website, danusirishherbgarden.com, for more information about us and about the herbal medicine courses I offer and the Wise Woman Way training. And if you go to the shop, you can find the books, the weed handbooks and other herbal goodies. And remember, we put a new film out every Sunday. So looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.